I'm a conservation scientist um, and a conservation practitioner. So I do research about the ecological crisis, research designed to help us find ways of conserving biodiversity. And I've also worked in conservation practice, so not doing the research, but actually doing it. So I lived for 10 years in Madagascar, where I worked with local communities to establish uh, protected areas that were managed by local communities themselves and helping them find ways of of using their natural resources more sustainably so that forests and oceans can support the people that depend on them, but in a way that they don't get destroyed and we don't suffer the loss of nature at the same time. Madagascar is a very, very poor country. So people depend really heavily on natural resources. They depend on fish for protein. They depend on wood from the forest for, um, for, for cooking. But for various reasons, they're disappearing at, at too rapid a rate. And that means there's going to be a massive humanitarian crisis very soon when there is no wood left for people to um, to cook on there is no fish left for people to eat and of course it's going to get so much worse with climate change it's already the case now that um, people are unable to farm because they rely on the rain um, and the rains aren't coming there's drought or there's unpredictability rain, so people aren't able to farm anymore. They're forced to go into the forest to, to produce charcoal or to, to log precious woods. Just because climate change has meant the livelihoods that they rely on, their preferred livelihoods, just aren't viable anymore. And I think we're seeing this all around the, the tropical world at the minute. When we do hear about climate change in the media, it tends to be about melting of the polar seas or burning of forests in, in the tropics but actually we see major impacts in this country and we have been for several years now so um, two of the last three summers have been really really bad for crop production in 2018 we had a huge drought you'll remember all all the grass went golden because there was no rain over the summer and potato and i think wheat crops were down by 40 percent that year this similar thing looks like it's happening this year because of terrible weather yeah we had three named storms in february when people are, are sowing their crops um, lots of rain in august during harvest time we might think we're we're okay at the minute because if our crops fail you know, we're a wealthy nation, we can buy um, agricultural commodities from elsewhere. But what happens if crop production fails in multiple places at the same time? Then suddenly you have a global scramble for food and things get really, really bad. And yeah, a lot of very serious people are, are worried that this is going to be happening in, in the coming years. Apart from agriculture, our infrastructure in the UK just simply isn't ready for the changes that have already started to come. We had a fatal train derailment in Scotland due to um, you know, unseasonal rain and flooding and, and landslides that, that literally knocked a train off the tracks and, and, and people died. A bridge in London was closed because of incredible heat. The engineers just didn't think it was able to take the heat and they didn't think it was safe, so they had to close it. Um, we're going to see these issues all across our infrastructure in Britain and it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. We are not ready for what is already happening and what is coming. One of the big, big issues um, in this country and yeah, around the industrialized world is that people just aren't aware of what's happening because the media isn't covering it. And that's um, a big reason why I involve myself in Extinction Rebellion as a scientist, because Extinction Rebellion is playing the, the role of a fire alarm that the media should be and isn't. One of our, our founding principles is tell the truth. And as a scientist, that is why I participate with XR events and why I align myself with this movement because it is the one movement, I think, you know, the one campaigning or media organization in this country that is telling the truth, not just about the, 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 the science, but about the full implications of that science. They um, treated the COVID crisis as an emergency and amazing things happened. They locked down the country, they um, covered 80% of people's wages with the furlough scheme for people that, that weren't able to work. There was money coming out of every pore to, um, to support industry. And you know, all these things that people, that the government had always insisted was not po possible, they were suddenly possible and they were done. So, so COVID was a shining example of just what we can do. Another thing that was amazing about the COVID crisis was the willingness, the happiness with which people 
utterly changed their lifestyles because they understood the urgency, um, the imminence of the threat. And, um, but of course, the climate crisis is very different from the COVID crisis in that we're much better prepared to deal with, with uh, climate and ecological crisis. COVID crept up on us and we, yeah, we had to act just like that without really having plans in place, without really knowing what, what we were doing. With the climate and ecological emergency, we know what we're doing. We know what needs to be done. We have the technology. Everything's ready for us to go. We just need the political will. As, as a conservationist who's equally interested in the ecological crisis and the climate crisis, I'm really, really concerned by what we're seeing with our forests around the world. Um, since since uh, yeah, over the last couple of years, people will have watched in horror on the news as forests in Siberia burnt, and then forests in California burnt, and then Brazil, and then Australia, of course, which was a, a big thing, and then that was last year. And then this year, the Arctic again, and California again, and Brazil again. We really are um, entering the age of fire. And part of the reason why it's happening is that Forests are drying out with, due to changing rainfall patterns, and that means they're just much, much more susceptible to burning. But it's a particular problem because forests at the moment are carbon sinks. As they grow, they suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and they do this magical thing. They store it as wood, this wonderful um, long-term storage. What's happening as forests get degraded by human action, they get drier and they burn. And this is a huge, huge problem for three reasons. One is that it releases all the carbon that's stored in those systems back into the atmosphere. The second reason is that it reduces the size of the forest sponge that we need to soak up more carbon from the atmosphere. And that's really important because forests absorb about a quarter of all our carbon emissions. But it's also the case that forests are, are some of the richest ecosystems on Earth for wildlife. So as they burn, we, we, you know, it has a tremendous double impact on the ecological crisis and the climate crisis. So, so the loss of forests is, is, is something that keeps me awake at night and yeah, something I, I shed tears over. When governments talk about tree planting, what they're thinking of is industrial plantations of spruce and pine like we see in Scotland and Wales. And these places are deserts for wildlife. They're absolutely no good for wildlife. What's worse is if you plant a forest in a place that shouldn't have a forest, if you plant a, a forest in a, a fen or um, a heathland, you're actually destroying a valuable habitat for the heathland wildlife. Um, they're also, if you plant a forest in a carbon rich soil, it can actually trigger the soil to release that carbon. But the major problem with tree planting is that some people, and particularly uh, governments, see it as an alternative to um, reducing our fossil fuels, whereas it's not. We absolutely need to do both. You know, if, if your bath is overflowing, you don't invest in um, technologies that will soak up the floodwaters from your floor in the future, like planting trees. You turn off the tap. The first thing you do is turn off the tap. And that's what we need to do, turn off the tap of carbon emissions by stopping burning fossil fuels. There's a lot of emphasis in the environmental movement on personal change. And all of us try to reduce the impacts of our consumption. You, you know, we all have reduced the amount of, of, of meat we eat and we don't fly as much as we might like and, and, and things like that. But these changes will never um, amount to enough simply because most people don't care. And you know, if 10% of people make these changes, that's not enough to make change. We need the changes to come from the top. We need rules to, uh, you know, the, the laws that govern how goods are, are, are produced and, and manufactured. Um, and not just laws, but, but stimulus. So at the moment, um, you know, industrial governments around the world, throughout Europe and, and, and Britain and North America, are still subsidizing um, fossil fuel production. The reason we still burn fossil fuels is because they're artificially cheap, because we're paying for them to be cheaper with our subsidies. It would be um, ex an extremely simple thing to switch the subsidies, stop subsidizing fossil fuel, subsidize alternative technologies instead. So I think um, both in terms of setting the rules of the game that corporations play and in um, incentivizing uh, corporate behavior, it has to be governments.
I think the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill is a fantastically important step. If members of the House of Commons are hearing these ideas through people chanting about them outside, it's very easy for them to think of them happening outside of the processes of governance. Once it's all written down in a bill that is seriously debated in the House of Commons, it's much more real. MPs will see that they are now being asked to take these very, very serious actions. So whether or not the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill is passed as law when it's uh, debated in Parliament, I think it serves a very, very important function that will facilitate these things becoming law at some point in the near future. I've dedicated my life to the ecological crisis to try and to conserve nature. I've always wanted to be a wildlife conservationist, so I trained myself up to, to, to become one. I did multiple degrees, I volunteered for a long time. I've written countless scientific papers warning about the impacts of destroying nature and why we mustn't do it. Those warnings have been ignored. We've, as conservationists, we've developed lots of solutions. We know what we have to do to conserve biodiversity, but governments don't fund those solutions. They're not listening to us. And I feel, both in my professional and my personal life, I've done everything I could to try and have an impact on what's happening to our planet, and none of it's worked. Ordinary people do not have the same access to government as those that want to destroy our planet for profit have. So for example, the department responsible for um, energy and climate change met with fracking companies 30 times in 2018. They refused to meet with anti-fracking campaigners even once. The one way we can make our voices heard is by taking to the streets and shouting loudly. And believe me, I want to do something else on my holidays now. It's you know, three holidays in a row I've spent sitting in the street in London. I don't do this for fun. I've literally tried everything else. This is the last throw of the dice.